Srimati Karuna, the director of the Gandhi Memorial Center in Washington, D.C. I bring to you this series, Speaking of Gandhi, sharing the messages from the life of the Mahatma. In May of 1930, Mahatma Gandhi was imprisoned for launching the famous Salt Satyagraha, the Salt March. He made good use of his time in prison for rest and writing and study. Ten years earlier, he read no less than 150 books before being released from the same jail, Yarda Mandir, as he called it. This time, while imprisoned in Yarda Mandir, he decided to translate into English the ashram hymn book, the book of prayers and devotional songs which the residents of his Satyagraha ashram used in their morning and evening worship. He did this at the request of Mirabin, Madeline Slade, a British admiral's daughter who had become one of his closest disciples. But he was also aware that these translations would be read by countless others. Since Mirabin needed no translation of the dozen or so Christian hymns in use at the ashram, none of them appear in Gandhiji's translations. However, he did include Muslims, Jain, and Sikh verses. The selection of prayers from Gandhi's English translation of the Ashram Bhajanawali included Devotional songs of Kabir, Mirabai, Tukaram, and Sordas. The translation was completed between May and December 1930. Gandhiji received a letter from John S. Hoyland, an American, who had asked him if he might have permission to republish the hymns, translations of the hymns, in America. Listen as Hemamala Hetige reads the response that Gandhiji wrote to John S. Hoyland on December 15, 1933. You asked me some time ago whether you could publish those hymns. Of course you can, provided that you give me no credit for the composition. You may say that in the introduction that I had prepared a rough draft for English friends but principally for Mira. From Gandhiji's ashram observances in action, he describes how the hymns were used in the ashram worship. At the morning prayer, we first recite these shlokas, verses, printed in the ashram bhajanwali, and then sing one bhajan, followed by Ramdun, repetition of the name of God, and Gita Path, recitation of verses from the Bhagavad Gita. In the evening, we have recitation of the last 19 verses of the second chapter of the Gita, one bhajan and Ramdun, and then read some portion of a sacred book. Since the ashram was founded, not a single day has passed, to my knowledge, without this worship. 253 prayer songs, or bhajans, were translated by Gandhiji and published in his collected works. The Ashram Bhajanawali contained Sanskrit verses and hymns in Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, and Bengali. By September 14, 1930, Gandhiji wrote to Mirabin that he had finished translating the 65th bhajan, um, but there was a long distance yet to cover. He said he had not yet failed to do one per day. Gandhiji wrote to Mirabin from Yarda Mandir on November 6, 1930, the following message. Long or short, I hope to do at least one bhajan daily. The Marathi I finished with Kaka's assistance. The Bengali too I began, but on learning from Kaka that they were all translated by the poet himself or under his supervision, I left off, thinking it a profanation even to attempt. I have now, therefore, only 42 bhajans to do. Marathi being very short, I was able to do sometimes even three per night. 
I hope to finish before 42 days are out. The poet Gandhiji referred to was, of course, Rabindranath Tagore. Gandhiji again wrote to Miraben from Nyarda Mandir on December 8, 1930. In another 10 days, I shall have finished the translation of the Bajanwali. It has given me such joy. I am satisfied with the performance, save for the fact that in an act of love, it has no other merit, certainly no literary merit. But it will help you to know the meaning of the bhajans, and that was all I aimed at. And now here is the first verse of the morning prayer with comments that Gandhiji shared with Mirabin. Early in the morning, I call to mind that being which is felt by the heart, which is sat, the eternal, chit, knowledge, and sukum, bliss, which is the state reached by perfect men, which is the super state. I am that immaculate Brahma, which ever notes the states of dream, wakefulness and deep sleep, not this body, the compound made of elements, earth, water, space, light and air. I am sorry that the first verse needed correcting. The more I think, the more clearly I see the meaning. And then I do not mind how often I cut about the translation. Formerly I used to shudder to utter this verse, thinking that the claim made therein was arrogant. But when I saw the meaning more clearly, I perceived at once that it was the very best thought with which to commence the day. It is a solemn declaration that we are not the changeful bodies which require sleep, etc. But deep down, we are the being, the witness pervading the countless bodies. The first part is the recalling to mind the presence of vital principle and the second part is the affirmation that we are the vital principle description of the being the brahma is also quite opposite it is nothing else is sat it is all knowledge or light chit and naturally therefore it is all bliss sukum or the word generally used is anand the rest is simple. You will compare this translation with what you have already translated by Malijibai. If there is a material difference, let me have his translation. In scholarship, I should yield the palm to him. So now, God willing, you may expect a present of this character every week. And on December 29, 1930, Gandhiji wrote, this time I must be very brief as the post came two days late. I start therefore with the translation of the second verse. In the early morning I worship him who is beyond the reach of thought and speech and yet by whose grace all speech is possible. I worship him whom the Vedas describe as Neti. Neti, not this, not this. Him they, the sages, have called God of gods, the unborn, the unfallen, the source of all. I do not think that this calls for an explanation, any explanation. The translation of the preface is proceeding apace. And as there was no ashram post till Friday, I devoted the spare time to translating more. The result is that now there are only 10 more left. It will be then time to consider whether I can translate the Gita notes I am writing for the ashram inmates. Just now, 100 rounds on Takli take up much time. But I am now showing an increase in speed. And on January 3rd, 1931, Gandhiji wrote, I have read the two renderings you have sent me of the first verse of the morning prayer. For use and perhaps conveying the meaning, I prefer my rendering. 
If you find any obscurity anywhere, please tell me. The second I sent you by the last mail. Here is the third. In the early morning, I bowed to him who is beyond darkness, who is like the sun, who is perfect, ancient, called Purushottam, the best among men, and whom, through the veil of darkness, we fancy the whole universe as appearing even as in darkness. We imagine a rope to be a snake. The idea is that the universe is not real in the sense of being permanent. It is neither a thing to be hankered after nor feared because it is supposed to be God's creation. As a matter of fact, it is a creation of our imagination, even as the snake in the rope is. The real universe, like the real rope, is there. We perceive either when the veil is lifted and darkness is gone. Compare, and with the morn, those angel faces smiled, which I have loved long since and lost a while. The three verses go together, and I think are Shankar's composition. You do know of Shankar, do you not? Five more days and I shall have finished the translation of the preface. My suggestion is that I continue to send you the verses and the bhajans with such comments as then occur to me. When Gandhiji references the line, and with the morn, those angel faces smiled which I have loved long since and lost a while. Of course, those words come from the hymn, Lead Kindly Light, which was frequently sung in the ashram. On January 7, 1931, Gandhiji offered Miraben in his letter the fourth verse of the preface to the Ashram Bhajanavali. And here is the fourth verse. O Goddess Earth, with the ocean of thy garment, mountains for thy breast, thou consort of Vishnu, I bow to thee. Forgive the touch of my feet. By bowing to the earth, we learn or ought to learn to be humble, even as the earth is humble. She supports the beings that, are, that tread upon her. She is therefore rightly the consort of Vishnu. This conception, in my opinion, does no violence to the truth. On the contrary, it is beautiful and is wholly consistent with the idea that God is everywhere. There is nothing inanimate for him. We are of the earth and earthy. If earth is not, we are not. I feel nearer God by feeling him through the earth. In bowing to the earth, I at once realize my indebtedness to him. And if I am worthy child of that mother, I shall at once reduce myself to dust and rejoice in establishing kinship with not only the loveliest of human beings, but also with lowest forms of creation whose fate reduction to dust. I have to share with them, and if considered as mere life without the earthly tabernacle, I regard myself as imperishable. The lowest form of creation is just imperishable as my soul is. There was a bhajan, a mira bhajan, that had a deep hold on Gandhiji's heart. He translated this also, Haritum Haro. It is said that M.S. Subalakshmi had previously visited Gandhiji in Delhi and she sang Ramdun. Gandhiji then expressed the wish to hear Subalakshmi sing the song Hari Tum Haro, but she said that she was not familiar with it, and she suggested that a noted singer should sing the bhajan. In turn, Gandhiji replied that he would rather hear her speak the words than hear anyone else sing it. Feeling obliged, Subalakshmi worked with her friends who knew the tune and lyric, and 
The song was recorded at All India Radio Studios in Chennai, the night of October 1st, finishing at 2 a.m. on the 2nd of October. The following morning, the recording was airlifted to Delhi, where it was played to Gandhi in the evening of his 78th birthday, on October 2nd, 1947. This was to be his last birthday. A few months later, on January 30th, 1948, when Air India Radio announced Gandhiji's assassination, it was followed by the playing of Subalakshmi's recording of Haritum Haro, repeatedly. It was said that upon hearing it played on the radio that she fainted. Listen now as Mrs. Hemamala Hetige reads Gandhiji's own translation of Haridhum Haro, one of the bhajans he translated while at Yarda Mandir. And then you will hear the song beautifully sung by Mrs. Supriya Dutt. I have heard that Rama is the help of the helpless. I can produce the evidence of those saintly people who were helped by him in their adversity. So long as the elephant relied upon his own strength, his case was hopeless. But when in its helplessness he invoked the assistance of Rama, he responded, when hardly his name was half pronounced. When Drupadi felt helpless, he felt the call in his seat. And God, having multiplied her clothing, Dushasana, grew tired of trying. Man relies on his own strength, or his austerities, or the strength of his arms, or his wealth. Suddha says that when a man has exhausted all his resources and invokes the name of God, his grace descends upon him.
this singing of the Mirabhajan Haritum Haro by Mrs. Supriya Dutt was offered at Gandhi Jayanti at the Gandhi Memorial Center for the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhiji also translated this Kabir Bhajan, which is read by Hemamala Hetige. Open thy face, thou wilt see thy beloved. He is in everyone. Therefore, say nothing bitter of anyone. Do not brag about thy riches or youth. This case made of five elements will play false to the one day. Light up thy dark heart and do not move from thy purpose. Wake up in this temple, for thou hast got the priceless treasure, thy Lord. Kabir says, Let there be rejoicing, for the Lord's voice is heard within. And Gandhiji translated these verses of Guru Nanak. O God, I seek refuge in Thee. On seeing Thee, all my doubts have disappeared. Without my mentioning it, Thou hast known my trouble. Thou hast made me remember Thee. My misery is gone and I am all happiness. Joyfully do I sing Thy praise. Thou hast take me by the arm and pull me safe out of the dark well of Maya. Nanak says, the Lord has removed my bondage and brought me back though I had strayed away. And of course, Gandhiji translated one of his favorite songs, that written by the poet, the Gujarati poet, Narsi Mehta, Vaishnava Janato. This hymn concludes every episode of our Speaking of Gandhi podcast. Here are Gandhiji's own words in translation of Vaishnava Janato. He is Vaishnava who identifies himself with others' sorrows, and in doing so he has no pride about him. Such a one respects everyone and spe speaks ill of none. He controls his speech, his passions and his thoughts. May his mother be blessed. He is equidisposed towards all and has no desires. Regards another's wife as his mother, always speaks the truth and does not touch other people's property. He labors neither under the infatuation nor delusion and withdraws his mind from worldly things. He is intent on Ramanama. His body is sacred shine for pilgrimage. He is no miser and free from cunning, and he is conquered passions and anger. Narasayo says his presence purifies his surroundings. Mahadev Desai, Gandhiji's own personal secretary, wrote that this hymn, Vaishnava Janato, is almost as life breath to Gandhiji, and is sung on all occasions when we are called upon to face sorrow and joy with equanimity. Lakshmi Subramaniam writes in her new book, Singing Gandhi's India, that surveying his writings, she said, it is clear that he responded to music to all kinds of musical expression, from the Christian hymn to the bhajan to the azan. Gandhiji's pursuit of music was not driven by purely aesthetic and artistic considerations. His overriding concern was to create conditions for the constitution of the perfect moral subject, the satyagrahi, and thereby facilitate his or her pursuit of Swaraj, of self-rule. Within the space of the ashram, Gandhiji demonstrated considerable enthusiasm in aligning music to prayer and in setting standards for good music and for making it mandatory. By the end of his life, he turned to music again, this time deploying it as a form of personal salve and public prayer. 
urging his fellow travelers to listen attentively and to give in to the purity of experience that alone produced true music and melody. I look forward to sharing with you more messages from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. As he said, my life is my message. As always, we conclude our Speaking of Gandhi podcast with the singing of Vaishnava Janato by Dr. Samia Mahbub Ahmed. She and Jeffrey Hallam Bauer produced this arrangement for voice, piano, tabla, violin, guitar, and flute. Vaishnava